the Christian bookstore today, and I, outside they had this little table with all the uh, handouts and brochures and things like that, and I picked this one up, and I thought, well, I started reading through it, and I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. They have one, uh, one class being taught called The Essence of Compassion. Um, another class, how to, benefit, how to Be a Benefit to Others. And then Compassion in the Rockies. And then they have uh, How to Live Compassionately in a Troubled World. A lot of good stuff. That's some pretty amazing things. And then over here I saw they have um, Level 2, Birth of a Warrior. Wow. C cultivating the Willingness to Observe Our Cocoons of Habitual Fear and Defense Mechanisms. Uh, being a warrior in the world, developing the bravery to step outside our cocoons. Um, then they had another one over here called, um, if I can find it here. Yeah, listen, this one, this was, uh, here this says that this training teaches us how to take our practice off the cushion and into the world as a way of life. That sounds pretty neat, doesn't it? All that stuff there. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's being taught by the Shambhala <laughs> Medi <laughs> Meditation Center. <coughs> <coughs> now, that's just a sin. <laughs> this is what the church is supposed to be doing. You know, not from a meditation practice and the, all the other stuff they got in here that isn't so good. But um, if you don't do it, somebody else will. And so there needs this, even this teaching needs to be going on here. I don't teach anything for you just to listen to and then, you know, it, just put it in practice in your own life. The whole idea, that's why I do manuals. You don't need manuals to come here. You need manuals so you can take it back and teach it, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, the only thing <clears throat> that we have ever uh, said that somebody, well, even the DHT, we've told people they teach it. The only thing we don't allow people to do at this point is to technically to certify DHTs. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, and, and there's exceptions for that. And, and so, you know, but I'm saying generally, but everything we teach should be taught. It's not just for you to hear, it should be taken back and taught. So you should, whatever you need to do, you know, get a manual, get the CDs, or whatever it is that you need to get it, go back, <clears throat> teach it. Well, but, you know, I want to take it back to my, my community, but I, I'm not a teacher, and I really I don't want to talk in front of people. Then take the CD, put it on, and play it. And then when it gets done, turn it off and talk about it. And just fellowship and share, and you'll grow, right? And the group will grow, and the message will grow. And pretty soon, if we grow enough, we will force change in the church. Right? Because I'm telling you, you notice this isn't a minister's conference. Because if it was, I'd only have about three or four people here. Right? right. If there's going to be a change in the church, it's going to have to be a grassroots movement that makes the leaders change and do what the people see needs to be done. Now, that's a shame that it's that way, but that's the way it is. Because they're not going to... Why should they change? <clears throat> Honestly, they've got a pretty cushy job. Why should they change? Right? So, <clears throat> we... Um, we're going to be in chapter 2, session 2, or page 2. Isn't that right? Actually, no, we're not. We're on page 6. Let me get it right here. <coughs> yeah, not quite to part 2 yet. We'll get it this session, I think. Point B there in, on page 6 says, Every human is in a state of war. The war is both a personal and a corporate war. So first off, I'm going to give you some definitions and areas. A, you have civilians that are occupied territories. That would be just people walking down the street. They can be occupied territories. These are, there are hostile civilians and there are friendly civilians. But they must all be reached. Some people are friendly to the gospel. They're open to the gospel. Other people are openly hostile. But the, the thing is, you don't know who they are until you talk to them. And you cannot tell by looking at them. Right? It's amazing. Some of the people you think is not anything anywhere near God and because of the way they look or dress or, or, or their, you know, whatever their tattoos or their piercings or whatever else it is, and you get to talk with them and they know God better than you do. Why? Because they've been forgiven them more or they've given up more and just walking with God. And so you can't tell, but you've got to reach them. Number B, 1B, there are prisoners of war. These are soldiers or people that have been taken captive by a long-standing fault or sin. The enemy uses the person's sin consciousness to keep them ineffective. They can be freed by correct teaching, right? You can also free them by casting the thing out. But there's, even if you cast it out, there still has to be correct teaching. Otherwise, they'll go right back into it. <clears throat> Point two, 
Then there are soldiers. These are Christians that are actively engaged in the warfare against God's enemies and every expression of evil. And over time, we're going to see, we're going to be doing some more teaching along these lines that have to do with uh, attacking evil, basically, at the base. The next one, AWOL. These are people that are AWOL. These are Christians that have enlisted in the saint's army, that's God's army, and yet tries to live a normal Christian life. It says civilian, but it's, yeah. When, when I say normal Christian, I'm talking about what you see in the church. The normal Christian life is an, would be a civilian life, right? Now, that's not normal according to the Bible, but it's normal meaning average in the church. But a, an, an AWOL Christian is a person who comes in, hears the gospel, and yet goes and tries to live like their neighbors. You know, they may not sin as openly, or their sins may be omission rather than commission, but they are still not fighting against the enemies of God. They're not actively <clears throat> enforcing God's will. Those are people that are AWOL, absent without leave. Four, there are traitors. Traitors are those who have professed allegiance to Christ, yet practice sin. You did that? You say you pledge your allegiance to Christ, but you practice sin. If you do that, you are a traitor, right? You're not even a prisoner of war. You're a traitor. There's a difference. <clears throat> the traitor practices sin, and even though he knows better, he really doesn't have that much regret about it. And they know, and the thing is, you ask them, why don't you repent? And they'll say, well, you know, I've repented a bunch of times. And even when they do, maybe they come down front at an altar or something and they repent. But even at that point, they know they're going to do it again. Now, if that's a case you've been in, then you're a traitor, right? But you can fix that. All you have to do is submit to the will of God. It's real simple. Most people that become Christian do so f for one of three reasons. And this was something that, matter of fact, I just ministered this recently. <clears throat> when I joined the military, this was back in the late 70s, I, was, I noticed that there were three kinds of people that joined the military. Back then, you could actually join the military if you had any type of um, uh, legal or, let's say, a, let's say police business, and there was uh, charges against you or, or warrants filed or something like that, you could join the military, and back then, they would basically erase all that, you know, unless it was too serious, and then they wouldn't. But overall, you could pretty much get in, and that just by you joining the military, they would forget your, your criminal past. And so there were people that joined the military to avoid prosecution. They just joined the military just so they could get away from their, what have they been doing? Then there were some people that joined the military for fame or glory. They thought they were going to be the next Patton. Then you had other people <clears throat> that joined because they truly loved their country and they wanted to do something to give back to what people ahead of them had done. And they loved their country, and they loved their fellow man, and they wanted to defend them and protect them and do their part. And just recently, God showed me that again, and he said, that's exactly the way it is in the church. you got three kinds of people. you got some people that join the church and claim to be Christian because they want to avoid prosecution. They just don't want to go to hell. They don't want to live a godly life. They don't hate sin. They don't hate anything about it. They really, and if you took away all threat of punishment... If they committed a sin, if you took away all the threat of the punishment of that thing, they would still be sinning today. And so they really quit sinning just because they don't want to go to hell. Okay? Those are people who avoid, those are people who, who join the church to avoid prosecution. It's the same thing. Then there are people who join for fame and glory. You hear it on so called Christian television all the time. You know, be a Christian. You'll be blessed. It'll be wonderful. It'll be, all your problems will end. And if you give the right pledge at the right time and make the right vow, then all your problems will be over. Okay? Those are people that join for fame or glory. Then you got your, for, for personal benefit, we would say. Then you got people that join up for the true reason that makes them a Christian. And that is they love God and they love their fellow man. And when you do that, you have fulfilled the law. That's what Jesus said. So those three types <clears throat> you see joining the military, but you also see in the church.
because human nature is the same across the board, right? Now, <clears throat> we've already talked about, let's look at traitors a little bit more. They have professed allegiance to Christ, yet practice sin. They often have bouts of sorrow and regret, but not a sorrow that leads to repentance that need not be repented of, the Bible says. And finally, number five, then there are revolutionaries. These are soldiers who have professed allegiance to Christ and are actively engaged in the revolutionary war against the enemy of God. They have made a commitment to live according to the dictates of the Bible and have rejected a life of compromise to, com to comfort and ease. In other words, things would be better for you. You know, you'd be promoted if you just wouldn't talk to that Jesus stuff all the time. You'd get a better shift. The only reason you're not getting on the shift you want now is because the, the manager of that shift doesn't like to hear that Jesus stuff all the time. And so every time you put him to be transferred to that shift, he rejects it. So if you just tone that down a bit, you'd get a raise and get what you want, get the right days off. But it, you have to realize you can't compromise just to get some comfort and ease or promotion or anything else. Now, that's a revolutionary lifestyle. Sorry to say. It should be the norm. That should be, every Christian should live at that. So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, just proving to you that, you're, that you are a soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In the next verse, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now our problem is, we think we can do both. You must, and we're going to talk about this later on, probably tomorrow or the next day. You must decide to commit your life, dedicate your life to the same end that God has dedicated his existence. And you say, well, what is that? Well, if you don't know it, it's real hard to dedicate your life to it, right? So you got to know it before you can really dedicate your life to it. So what has God dedicated himself to? Essentially, it is this. God has dedicated himself to the ultimate good of the entire universe. Now, if he has dedicated himself to the ultimate good of the entire universe, then you can do no less. And if you dedicate yourself to the ultimate good of the entire universe, then the first thing, the first step to that is dedicating yourself to the worship of God, to loving Him, and loving your fellow man as yourself. I mean, because if, if you could imagine, it's amazing how simple this stuff gets after a bit. But if you go back to that, and, and you should know, and I was going to work those scriptures in here somewhere, right? Because that is the essence of Christianity. Love God. Keep His commandments. Love God. Love your fellow man as yourself. Right? right? Do to them what you would have done for you. If you do that, this fulfills the law and the prophets. And yet... And, and honestly, if you would take those three scriptures that I just gave you, or three laws, if you want to say, or three commandments, actually it's two commandments and one explanation. And if you'll take those three points and apply, use, the, use them as a filter against every doctrine you ever hear, you'll find out what's Bible and what isn't. Because if there's a doctrine you hear taught that says, don't, now, don't go out there and pray for the sick until your life is perfect and you're cleaned up, okay? You run it through the filter of loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, meaning you would do for them whatever you would have done for you, and that doctrine doesn't hold up. Isn't that right? Because if you love them, you're gonna, if, you want, if you want to be prayed for, you've got to go pray for them, right? Do you want somebody to walk past you just because their life isn't perfect? Or would you rather them pray for you in faith and get you healed or get you delivered? I mean, do you really care what their life is like that much? And I'm not saying about somebody that's living in outright sin and all kinds of problems. I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about a, a, a person who names the name of Christ, follows God, has <clears throat> you know, basically gotten sin out of their life, not walking in a habitual sin for sure. Would you want them to walk past just because they weren't perfect? Because if you do... Let me tell you, you're never going to get prayed for because there ain't nobody perfect. Isn't that right? Everybody's working and trying to work out their own salvation. Everybody's trying to, to fix this or fix that. or Everybody could be closer to God in some degree, right? So at some point, you have to, be, you have to start. So, next. Let me see here. Yeah. Point C, page 7. 
<clears throat> so I've proven to you that, that there is a war, that every human being is in this state of war, and now we're going to see that you must win this war. And the reason you have to win this war is, number one, your destiny depends on your victory. See, your destiny does not depend on you walking down an aisle. You need to get that. Your destiny does not depend on you walking down an aisle. A lot of people walk down aisles and walk back as big a sinners as they walk down. Most of them just walk back with a false sense of security. Because now they think they're okay and they can do whatever they want or whatever that's, you know, whatever's going on and they're okay. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Verse 5, Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Revelation 2, 7, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Not to he that is overcome, but see, we put a, a premium on people getting beat. You know, well, look what all they went through. Look at all that. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm looking at all you went through. He said, he that overcomes. And this may not be real pleasant, but it's what the Bible says. Next, Revelation 2, uh, what is it? 2, no, Revelation 2.11? Yeah, 2.11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation 2.17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that is that receiveth it. Revelation 2.26, And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. See how many times it's saying to him that overcometh? All of Revelation 2 is talking about he that overcomes. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So who's going to be not blotted out? He that overcomes. Isn't that right? 3, 12. He that overcomes. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out, go no more, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, to him that overcometh. <clears throat> Three twenty one, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Revelation 21, 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. <clears throat> so you must overcome. Isn't that right? Your destiny will, is determined by whether you overcome. Simple as that. It even says, even back in the Gospels, He that endureth to the end. Over and over again. It doesn't just say, He that walks down an aisle and shakes a hand. Matter of fact, he talks against that in some ways and says, you know, with your, your lips you draw nigh to me, but your heart is far from me. And he said, not every man that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, but he that, what? Keeps my word, does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Isn't that right? The destiny of others also depends on your victory, which is another reason why you have to win. In John chapter 20, verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, you overcoming has to do with you going also and telling people that their sins are remitted or retained. Now, what you mean, what I mean by that and what is meant here is that if you don't go tell them, they're going to die in their sins. And if you go tell them, then they can live. So your job, it, for them to receive, 
what God has given to all of us, you have to go tell them. Therefore, you have to overcome. You have to overcome fear. You have to overcome all the, the intimidation. You have to overcome everything that would stop you from doing the will of God. You must do the will of God. Pretty simple, huh? Now, <clears throat> number three, you have been destined to win. Well, that's all the overcoming scriptures I just gave you before, right? And 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and makes manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. In, yeah. Actually, we get to move on to the first principle. <clears throat> now the reason I was saying all this is because you have to realize there is a war, you're in it, you've got to win, if you don't win, other people can't win. And that, just as he said here, you were destined to win. That's his destiny for you. Now, you winning, I'm not talking about some self-help gospel, right? I'm not talking about some type of self-motivation or, you know, a motivational type of gospel. I like what Dr. Lake used to say, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is enough to make any man the wildest kind of enthusiast. But if you look at most Christians, they're anything but an enthusiast. Why? Because they haven't got the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've got a man-made gospel that ends up putting people in bondage rather than setting people free. As I've heard Dr. Summerall say it. I've heard a couple other preachers say it too. Uh, I think even uh, Michael Brown, and, and he was one of the guys that I heard say it, kind of a variation of it. He said, <clears throat> I would rather get to heaven, and Raven, uh, Lyndon Ravenhill, I think, told him that. He said, I would rather get to heaven and have God say, you were too strict on yourself than to get to heaven or not make it to heaven and say you were too loose. Dr. Summerall used to say it this way. He said, it's better to be safe than sorry. If there's a question, don't do it. Meaning if it's a question, if it's sin or not. Now, I would tell you this. If you read it in the Bible, <clears throat> do it. You say, well, if there's a question, don't do it. You should have no questions about what's written in the Bible. Anything you see in the Bible, you should do automatically. You don't need any leading. I know you've heard, most of you have heard this a thousand times before. But a command has within itself its own leading. You never, God does not have to speak to you to have you do what's right. One of the things that I, I'm, I can't wait to get there, I, was, I really wanted to put it at the front of the book, but I knew if I did, it would have been, that the whole chapter would have been the whole seminar. Right? It, I just wouldn't have got off of that chapter. So I had to put it the last one to make sure that we get there. But it is the principle of moral obligation. That principle, I'm telling you, that is the sum total of everything. And when you get a hold of that and you understand why you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do and how you do it, it gets so simple. Because the, the principle of, of moral obligation essentially just says you do what you're supposed to do because you're supposed to do it. And then you get right into the thing that if God is God, then you should obey him. And if he's God, if he's, if he's truly God, then he is the most powerful, for him to be God, he has to be the most powerful being in the entire universe. And if that's true, then you should serve him as though he is the most powerful being in the entire universe. And if he's not the most powerful being, then he wouldn't be God. And therefore, if he wasn't, then whatever is stronger than him would be God, which takes us right back to the most powerful being in the universe is God. So that is the essential, basic, fundamental. Because it's the only thing that can't be turned around and explained further. It is incumbent upon itself, and it, the very law itself proves, the law itself proves that it is true. And then you work outward from there. And it gets real simple once you get a hold of that. And that's why you must dedicate yourself to the end that God has dedicated himself. He has dedicated himself to the good of all human beings of all, of all creation. And he knows. People say, then, I thought I was created to worship. That's just one part of it. One part. It's not everything. It's one part. And if you, the reason you're created to worship is because God is God. And the funny thing is, is that when you dedicate yourself to the ultimate good of the entire universe, you will have to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength because that's the ultimate good of the universe is to love God, right? And your neighbor is yourself, which is an outflow of you loving God because when you love God, you can't help but love your neighbor when you truly love God because the Bible says, how can you say you love God whom you haven't seen when you can't love your fellow man who you do see? So all of this, I'm telling you, 
even in the teaching that we've been doing over the last couple of years, we are reaching a point of critical mass. It's getting to the point where I promise you, you know, when they were doing the uh, atomic bomb <clears throat> back in the 40s, they reached a point where they knew that they could go so far with it, but they knew not to go too far because their biggest fear was that if it was ever used, it would start a chain reaction in the atmosphere and would burn up the whole earth. And I'm telling you, we're at that point in the spiritual realm where if we go just far enough and, and push that button, so to speak, and go for critical mass, we're going to reach a point that I promise you, you hide and watch. You can be a part of it or you can stand back and watch it happen, but it's going to happen. And what we're going to see is a massive chain reaction in the church that's going to set off a revolutionary spirit within the church. Now, that's said revolutionary and not revolutionary, right? And I'm not talking about rebels. I'm talking about rev revolutionaries, right? And it's going to cause a chain reaction that in a moment's time, the church is going to change. It's going to seem like it's overnight. It's going to be just so different because it's going to spread, as we would say, like wildfire. Because once it hits, it's going to make a difference like the world hasn't seen, not even since the first century church, because it's going to be better. Because it'll be the glorious church of Ephesians and not the infant church of Acts. But it's going to take a group of people, not just a group, but a body of people, <clears throat> that, w that are willing to cross the line that man drew that says they shouldn't go there. And when they do, it's going to start. And then we're going to see this change. And then the church is going to run and try to catch up. And they're not going to be able to. Right? So, next. <clears throat> now, the, the principle of security. First off, what I'm going to do in pretty much every case here, I'm going to give you the principle, the name of it. I'll give you the definition of it. Then I'll give you the enemy's use of that principle both in individual combat against an individual person, how he uses it against you, and then I'm going to give you how he uses it against a corporate body in a church setting. So pretty much it should you know, show you all the ways, and then I'm going to show you how the Christian should use the principle in individual warfare, and then how the Christian should use it in corporate warfare. All right? So it should cover all the bases and give you a good understanding of the principle so that you can look and tell what principle is being applied against you and you would know, you'd know how to, how to stop it and how to defeat it. So, first off, the principle of security is this. Never permit the enemy to acquire an unexpected advantage. Now, I know this sounds simple, but we still do it. So, you never let the enemy get an unexpected advantage. In other words, if you see an area of weakness or you see something where the enemy could get advantage then you pay attention to that point and you either build it up so it's no longer a weakness but it becomes a strength or at least you keep your eyes on it so that if the enemy does exploit that particular area, he's not getting an unexpected advantage, you're ready for him. Right? That would be termed somewhat like an ambush. He comes into an area where he thinks you're not ready and you, you're ready for him. Okay? Now, no operation, no plan, no operational plan extends with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the main body of the enemy. In other words, you can make all the plans you want, and they can look perfect on paper, but as soon as you actually make contact with the enemy, all your plans are pretty much useless. Because you can assume that the enemy's not going to do exactly what you thought he was going to do, and at the point where you make contact, your plans cease being effective, and then you know what you revert back to? Training. Every time. So how you train is how you're going to fight. And how you train will determine the outcome. And when you can make all the plans you want, but whenever you meet the enemy, there's going to be a time when your mind is going to freeze. And because he tries to bring fear or confusion or something else on you, your mind is going to freeze. And at the point your mind freezes, you're going to have to switch over from cognitive thinking into what is generally called intuitive thinking. And intuitive thinking is not there naturally, but it is trained response. And so you have to train. See, that's why you see these guys in these martial arts schools, and they're in there every night. You drive by, and they're all in there, and they're all sweating, and they're punching, and they're, and it says, okay, throw a punch, and he blocks, and he does, and, does, and they, they have set moves. He throws this punch, and here's your response. Have you ever thought in a fight, you never see a guy walk up to you when you're fixing to fight this guy, and this guy does this. 
and gets ready, you know, and then he steps forward and punches. That never happens. Say, so they say, well, why do you train it that way? Well, because they're training them this way so that they're getting their basics down, and when they step forward, it gives a preset visual representation of this punch coming in. And what you do mentally is you see all this and you get trained for it. So whenever he drops back, you know what's coming and you can block. And then and you do it enough until you don't even have to think about it. As long as you have to think about it, you are not trained. All right? You take a dog. You say, is he house broke? You know what that means? That means when he has to go, he goes to the door or something to let you know. When he does that every time, guess what? He is trained, right? So until he does that, he's not trained. So as long as you're working with him, he's not trained. That's the training, right? You're training, but not trained. And you have to do enough training until it becomes second nature to where you don't have to think about it. That's why you can make all the plans you want. And the plans just give you a general idea, and hopefully you'll get further down the road with your plans before you actually meet the enemy. So the plans give you the overall plan, so to speak, and you try to get as much of the plan done before you meet the enemy. But at some point when he pops up, then the plan basically stops, even though you're still going to go after your objective, but the plan stops, and now you're going on training. And you just learn to react. Now, <clears throat> in dealing with God, everything is heart, right? It is your intentions, it is your your, your motivations, all that stuff. That's what God counts. Now, you can heal the sick with wrong motivations, and it won't even count. Because all it counts is what comes out of good intentions. Now, the sick person can get healed, but you won't get credit for it, because your intentions were wrong. Right? But the sick person benefits because you did it. So even if you do it out of wrong intention, intentions, the sick person still benefits, right? Just like what Paul said, if I give all my goods to the poor and I give my body to be burned, then it profits me nothing. Well, yeah, that's right. It doesn't profit you anything. It profited the people to whom your goods were given, right? And so it comes back to the intentions and motivations of why you're doing it. Now, when it comes to spiritual warfare, very little goes back to your intentions. Because if it went back to your intentions, then... Average people couldn't use these principles, but they're used every day. So the learning the principles is the main thing at this point. Now, I'm not saying learn the principles and forget your relationship with God. I don't ever say that in any teaching we do. Your relationship with God should never be forgotten. And it's always important. Uh, your, your relationship with God is always relevant, but not always to the outcome. Let me say it this way. The only thing that is relevant as far as your relation with God when it comes to the outcome is whether or not you get credit for it. That's the only thing. But if you learn the principles, you can use them. And you, you look through history, you look in the Bible, and you'll find a lot of people that use the principles and yet didn't have a true heart with God. There were a lot of people in the Bible that did the things God told them to do, and yet they didn't even have the Spirit of God. Especially, well, definitely weren't born again, but yet they... We're doing things even out of wrong motivation sometimes. And yet still, I mean, come on, look at Jonah. Jonah fulfilled God's will, didn't he? But he sure didn't want to, right? Didn't want to, but he ended up doing it. So there's, there's situations like this. Now, <clears throat> next. Well, the end part of that is planning is everything, but plans are nothing. So should you plan? Yes. Why? Because planning makes the objective clear. And it puts everybody on the same page. But the plans themselves, once you're in operation, really don't mean much because then you have to operate on a second-by-second -second basis and making decisions. And see, that's where Christians don't want to do that. We don't want to make decisions because we don't want to be responsible. We want to put it back on God. Well, God, you tell me which way to go. You tell me what to do here. You tell me all these kind of things. Yes, we, sh we, 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 we should not lean to our own understanding. But in all things, acknowledge Him. Isn't that right? Well, as a Christian, that's what you've done. When you got born again, you said, you know what? My understanding doesn't count. I'm acknowledging you in everything now. Now, if you just took him as Savior, that may not be true. But if you take him as Lord, it has to be true. Isn't that right?
You can't acknowledge him in all things without him being Lord. So lordship is the important thing here. Now, he also says, or the next quote, <clears throat> once the objective has been attained, you must ensure that you are protected from retaliation or counterattack by employing the principle of security. An enemy to security is complacency and overconfidence. You must make plans for a further attack should the enemy counter. So basically what I'm saying is you are involved in a celestial game of chess. And you're always looking two or three, at least two or three moves down the, down the game. You're going to look at your move and whatever he could do. And then you're going to look at your counter to, what, to every option that he could make. You have a counter for it. See, that's why Norman Schwarzkopf won the first desert war so quickly and so efficiently because he had an entire plan worked out that had every alternative and, every, and a counter to every alternative so that nothing the enemy did ever surprised him, right? The principle of security would negate the principle of surprise. But now whenever you can put the principle of surprise and the principle of security together and work them together, what that means is you show up where the enemy doesn't know you are and yet you have your flanks covered and you have everything grounded so that once you attack, the enemy can't counterattack because you've already thought of his counterattack and you plan for it. He's beat. And see, so you can start planning this way. And you say, okay, now, how does this work for us individually or how does this work here? And we're going to talk about it in just a moment, about on an individual level, on a level, and, and generally this entire course, this one, is dealing with two levels, individual combat and corporate warfare in a church. Now, when I say a church, I'm talking about a, a body of believers that gather together regardless of where you meet or, or what. But I'm talking about people that have gathered together <clears throat> under the same banner, so to speak, with the same cause and the same vision in mind. And when you get together like that, then that would be a corporate warfare. And you're going to start seeing what happens in, <clears throat> and I don't like to use the Romans always as an example, <clears throat> but the Romans had a particular tactic that they called the tortoise which they had their square shields, or rectangular shields actually, and they had hooks, literally, that they could latch them together, and each soldier knew what part of the tortoise he was. And when they would move into an area against an enemy, whenever they would call for that particular maneuver, they would all latch their shields together, and it, w it went in like clockwork, to where everybody knew exactly where their shield was supposed to be, and it made a little shell and they were all under it, and you couldn't hit them with an arrow. You couldn't hit them with anything. Nothing could get through that shield. It was like having one large shield. They were like the first tank at that point. And there was literally no weapon, because when they hooked together, if you come in and hit a man, you can knock him backwards. But when they all hooked together, you hit one man, all of them absorbed the blow, and therefore there was no effect on the overall you know, unit. And so that's what, as a body of Christ... That's what you have to learn to do. Every person has to be able to come together and do their part. Every person will join together, and not every person's part is the same thing. You may be the front of the tortoise. You may be the top of the tortoise, the side or the back, somewhere you fit in. And if you don't put your shield up when the enemy comes in and everybody else is in, you're the weak link, and you're where the enemy's coming in. And if you're part of a group, that is effective in spiritual warfare, and you're causing the enemy some problems, and you're the weakest one there, guess who the enemy's going to pick on? He's going to go around and probe. It's called a probing attack. And they don't really mean to do too much. They just want to see what your response is, and they want to see if you're serious or how quick you'll give up or how weak you are. And if you are the weakest, if they hit several sides and you're the weakest one, they'll come back to you. And when they come back to you, they're going to hit you with your weak point. And if you're, maybe your weak point is finances. That's where they're going to hit you. And maybe you're real strong in, in health you know, or in healing per se, per se, as far as you know, understanding it and walking in it. Well, more than likely, he's not going to hit you with a sickness. But if you have a weak understanding of deliverance or of any of these other areas, he's going to hit you in your weakness. And so that's why many times in corporate warfare, you see an attack all at the same time, but at, in different ways. People go, wow, what is this? This person got hit here and this person got hit. Well, guess what? Each one of those are the weakness in that person, which makes the overall body weak. That's why there has to be topical teaching. There has to be teaching on each area. 
and you have to be strong in each area. You can't pick what you want to be strong in. Because whatever you pick to be your strength, then you, at the time you pick your strength, you're also picking your weakness. And so basically what you're saying is, I really like this, and so therefore the enemy can attack me here. So you don't get to choose. It'd be like going to the military and them saying, okay, we're going to do PT, physical training today. Oh, well, you know, I don't like to pull ups. I'm just going to do push ups. And he's going to say, yeah, okay, we'll see. And, and then you go do the pull ups, and if you can only do half what everybody else can do, guess what your remedial training is going to be? Push, pull ups. Why? Because that's your weakness. You work on your weaknesses until they become your strong points. And whenever your weaknesses are your strong points, then your old strong points are still strong points. You understand that? And therefore the enemy, see, you've got to believe that there is a place in the body of Christ, not high and exalted, a normal place for Christians to walk where nothing can by any means hurt you. You've got to learn to believe that just like Jesus said, the wicked one comes and has nothing in me. Isn't that right? No way to get in. He, there's nothing in me that he can draw on. Because the Bible says that when a man is drawn away, he's drawn away of his own lust. In other words, Jesus is saying, he's got nothing to pull on me with. Because that's where he comes in. And the Bible even says that if you look for his coming, you'll, you'll purify yourself even as he is pure. But it also says there that you, he, you keep yourself from the wicked one. Believe it or not, that's what it says. Because we're always praying, oh God, keep me. God is faithful to keep that which is committed to him. Isn't it right? So you don't need to pray on, for God to do his job. He's going to do his job. You do your job. And the Bible says that you will keep yourself. Now think about that. Well, how do you keep yourself? By being strong in the areas of life. Because he's given you defenses for every one of them. Now, actually, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and take a break. Yep. Let's take a break. About 10 minutes. <laughs> 